This video is sponsored by Squarespace. The day began like any other. Trimming my fingernails in the cool morning steps. Feeding myself Oreos. Drinking cold brew coffee. But then I looked at a tweet that I had made a few weeks ago saying, List here, imaginary and non-existent inventions I should try drawing. And I saw all these incredible creative responses and I thought, I should try drawing a few of these. And so I sat down to do that. I lit my candle to set the mood, warm apple pie or something like that. And then I got to work inventing things without sketching them out or any sort of planning at all. But I assure you, any of these inventions could work somehow. In this video, I'm going to use three different types of ink. Uh, I bought these inks a long time ago, and I was just, no, I just had never used them before. And I'm using a Twisby Go pen, mostly because it's easy to switch out inks with this pen. It has this cool spring-loaded piston thing. This is a cheaper um, version of a Twisby Eco, maybe. Uh, which I've used in a previous video, but um, by cheaper, I don't mean it's lower quality. I still like it a lot, and I like how it looks. I like the spring. Uh, I don't know. I, just, I like how the spring looks on it. And so I got down to drawing, inventing, creating some new impossible contraptions. Now, I will say some of the things people uh, suggested in the Twitter comments were not completely impossible, such as someone suggested an employee gruntler, uh, I expect that would just be maybe paying them well, treating them well, um, a water bottle filler. I mean, it could be a cool invention, but I think those already exist. I've used them before. But I guess I, I guess I maybe the idea there is that I create a, a weird, crazy contraption version of that. Also, one invention that popped up more often than I expected was uh, a dream to video converter. This seems to be in high demand, so someone should hop on that. Someone said Dream to Video Converter. Someone said the Dream Expander, a device that allows others to watch your dreams. Oh, this person said Imperial Star Destroyer. That's obviously not impossible. It already existed a long time ago, far, far away. I'll, I'll put a link in the description to this tweet, and there's at the time of me making this video, there's like 85 replies, a lot of really funny and creative suggestions. Maybe you can get some ideas for drawings of your own. Um, but like what I said, I, I draw weird contraption-looking things pretty often, but usually I don't start out with ideas in my head for what it's going to be at the beginning. At, at the most, I might have an idea, like, I want to draw a contraption type thing. Like, I want it to be more mechanical looking than slimy, blobby, organic looking. And then towards the end, I think, hey, look, it, it looks like maybe it'll, you know, be something that goes on your desk, sized, and maybe it'll have some arms here and do this. Or maybe this is actually the size of uh, a planet. Or maybe it's just the, just the size of a dump truck. Uh, and that's usually as far as I get towards the end of a drawing. Uh, and if, if I get really, really lucky, I might, it might actually have some purpose towards the end of a drawing. But here I tried to actually have a concrete purpose in mind at the beginning of the drawing. This first drawing is a, a very elaborate and complicated machine that only produces ham and cheese sandwiches. And as you'll see towards the end of the video, when I explain all my drawings, I'll, I'll, co I'll go back through all of these and explain what I was thinking my thought process, how I think all of these work, um, you'll see that there were some problems due to the fact that I didn't plan anything out or sketch it out beforehand or anything like that. So my approach isn't flawless, but I still like it. But say perhaps you are an inventor of slightly less imaginary and more possible things. You might want a website so that other people can keep track of your progress. You can use Squarespace to very easily make and host such a website to post updates, to sync these updates with all sorts of other social media, or to start something like a podcast about your inventions or not inventions. Whatever else you have going on, Squarespace makes it easy to get other people involved in, with, and excited about whatever you're working on 
Plus, it links with all of your other social media. So anything you post elsewhere online can get synced to your Squarespace website. And anything you post on Squarespace can get automatically synced up to your social media. So go check it out now. It's squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash peterdraws for 10% off your first website or domain. Now, I just have to briefly apologize because I just, I realized that I was criticizing some of the tweets, the replies to my tweet for not listing strictly impossible inventions because that's what I thought in my head I had asked for, but really I only asked for imaginary and non-existent inventions. But, I mean, is it so weird? I guess almost at every point in time we... Throughout history, we always feel like everything that can be invented has been invented. I mean, people a hundred, a thousand years ago probably thought that. They're like, we are now here at the peak of scientific ad advancement. It, it can't get any better. I mean, I, don't, I guess we don't really think that now because even now we're looking ahead like soon we'll be able to fly to Mars or whatever. So I guess... We know some things that don't exist that we want to figure out still. But at the same time, if we knew it was possible, wouldn't we already have done it? And everything that is possible and we haven't done, it, we must only be held back by money or resources or the ability to cooperate to do it, right? I'm not sure. Maybe some things just take a long time to do. A lot of research and trial and error. Anyway, let me speak briefly to why I like drawing drawings like these. And that's basically because I, I spend a lot of time looking at diagrams and uh, cross-section drawings, like those ones by, I think his name's Stephen Beastie. Yeah, like Stephen Beastie's Incredible Cross-Sections. I would, every time I went to the library uh, as a kid, I would get all of those. Whatever books of those, th these are all the books I w would look for when I went to the library as a kid. Um... Stephen Beastie's Incredible Cross Sections, uh, Where's Waldo, uh, and then those um, those books where you had to f search for things. They, had, they were like collages made of like little objects, and you had to search for objects. I don't remember what those are called. I would, I would get those, and then I would go to the I would go to the Calvin and Hobbes section, and I would get all of the Calvin and Hobbes books, uh, and I think. Oh yeah, and I would pro I would usually get a uh, a Guinness Book of World Records book, and those are I feel like those are my main go to. Did you know that the Guinness Book of World Records holds the Guinness Book of World Records for the most stolen book from public libraries? I never stole any of them, but I do remember going to the main desk at the library once and asking, "How many books can I check out?" And they said I could check out 99 books at a time, and I was blown away. I don't think I ever checked out 99 at a time, but I was, I was, I mean, I felt a little bit selfish for, you know, grabbing every single Calvin and Hobbes book on the shelf every time I went, and every single Incredible Cross Sections book on the shelf every time I went. But I would, I mean, they were not wasted on me, okay? I would look at every line on every page and just soak it all up. I, I found Waldo on all those pages and all the Where's Waldo books, even though I know he's called different things in different countries. I think he's only called Waldo in the United States and Canada. Wally in the United Kingdom. I think maybe Australia. I think Wally might be his most common name, actually. And he's actually called Charlie in French. Any French people in here that can confirm he's called Charlie in French? <laughs> and, and in Danish, is it really... Is his name really Holger? <laughs> Anyways, yeah, I loved big, oversized. I, I, I found out. I, I quickly found out that libraries had special sections of most bookshelves where they put the big, oversized books that invariably had big, colorful drawings and photographs and illustrations in them that wouldn't fit on the regular sections of the shelves. So I would look on the that area of every bookshelf to just see if anything was there that, you know, the bigger, better books. I would just grab them and check them out. It was amazing. All right, so we, we finished drawing all four of these now. And at this point, I just kind of want to go back through them 
and maybe point out a few of the things, just what I was thinking, uh, maybe things that weren't completely, totally obvious, uh, just by looking at it, okay? So here's the first one. A very elaborate and complicated machine that only produces ham and cheese sandwiches. This one was suggested by at Bokeypunk. Thank you. Good suggestion. So basically what happens here is uh, this little conveyor belt here um, provides whole loaves of bread. And then there's like a rotary slicer here that slices the loaves of bread into slices. And this little section here holds the slices of bread. And then one slice of bread plops down here onto the main production line conveyor belt, all right? But every other slice of bread is grabbed by this top slice conveyor belt, see? And then it's carried along. And after everything else is added to the sandwich, it, it's, like a little, it's like a little tray. And it plops over and, and plops the top slice onto the sandwich once it's done. Just like bloop. And then you can see it. This is like a, it goes around the other side. So this conveyor belt kind of goes around laterally. I don't know if that makes any sense. Anyways, yeah, those pop around the other side. Uh, just keep going in a circle. And so the, kind of the same thing happens with cheese, except it's not quite as confusing because they only need half as much, one slice of cheese for every piece of bread. They're nice, generous slices of cheese, okay? One slice of cheese for every piece of bread and the chunk, the big hunks, chunks, blocks of cheese come rolling along the top here and drop down and they're sliced again. There's like a buzz saw or maybe maybe like a band saw or something. That, it's like, this, that's what these little things here are. It's like some little motorized saw. There's one slice of cheese right here that's dropping down onto the stack. And see the and then here, mayo and mustard are the two condiments you get to choose from. It's customizable though, even you can choose whether you want just mayo on the bottom, just mayo on the top, mayo and mustard both sides. See that's why I had it. It made the whole whole thing a lot more complicated, but you can have uh, mayo and mustard anywhere on the sandwich you want. Basically anywhere means on either slice. You know <laughs> And it took me until now to realize I didn't, <laughs> I didn't put ham. There's no ham anywhere in this process. <laughs> I don't know. I put, I mean, obviously that's the problem with not, not planning it out at all. I didn't know pre-sketching, pre-planning or anything. I just started. <laughs> started drawing and it's not a ham and cheese sandwich at all it's just a cheese sandwich with mayo and mustard but you can have the mayo and mustard anywhere in that occasion a, a equation you want below the cheese above the cheese on neither side of the cheese <sighs> okay i'm gonna have to edit this produces only produces <laughs> Cheese sandwiches. <laughs> it was a good suggestion, ham and cheese sandwiches, but I, I failed. <laughs> Do you think I still passed? I tried hard. A for effort. C, passing grade for effort, please. And this this here is just like some structural elements to hold these uh, conveyor belt arms together. And there's a metal plate here. Uh, that it's all kind of bolted to, you know, if you want to make one of these at home, just a cheese sandwich maker, I guess, that I even showed, you know, where you can bolt these uh, condiment tubes to the metal plate for it all to go together. And uh, there's wires that goes from each little thing. There's like little pressure gauges here. That's what these little things are to show how much that the pressure of the condiments are. You don't want a, a mayo fountain just busting out everywhere, mustard busting out and just, you need to keep an eye on the pressure, okay. All right, there you go, cheese sandwich maker. All right, here is a motivation actuator and procrastination inhibitor suggestion, suggested by Maria Asin. Basically what happens here is this big, you put on a headset, right? It's a big 
it's a big headpiece and um there are the I, this one i didn't label as heavily because i thought it looked a little i just like the aesthetic of more minimal labeling and this look this oh this dotted line right here i please forgive me it i i was holding my hand really weird when i drew this dotted line because i just written these words and the ink was still wet so i was like trying to not put my hand on top of the ink right here and so this dotted line did it's not a very nice curve but you still get the idea okay basically here's the motivation actuator if you're not feeling motivated th these these are little sensors these uh things are like drilled or rammed into your brain they're little brain sensors little diodes or something okay these are reading your brain waves they know what's going on in your mind whether you're motivated whether or not you're procrastinating. And so these wires go up the thing and it actuates motivation because as soon as you're not feeling motivated, you feel this thing, this contraption on top of your head start to vibrate. There's a little motor right here. The motor turns this gear this gear turns this whole thing and this whole big drill this big screw drill thing starts to slowly turn and go down and you know it's only a matter of moments before it makes contact with the top of your head so <laughs> believe me uh the motivation comes quickly uh a rapid assault of motivation and you can see here, this guy is some sort of scholar or something. He's wearing scholar's robes, it looks like, working on something. I don't know. The paper's blank right now, so that's a little bit worrying. I would get to work if I were you, person. Um, and But it helps to know. It, and I think it only takes once for that thing on your head to, to whir into a little bit of action. And you stay motivated for quite a while. And it'll, it'll back up again. Don't worry. Maybe. I'm not sure. Maybe it doesn't. Maybe just if it lowers a little bit, it's just there and it's just closer for the next time. So, <laughs> okay, and then the procrastination inhibitor. Um, there's just a little sensor up here, also tied into the whole your brain. And there's these two little wires holding up these two big hammers. And if they sense that you're procrastinating, the wires uh, release the hammers and they pop your head like a melon so in that way they inhibit procrastination <clears throat> it would i think it would work on me i don't know what the quality of my work would be like but all right here we have a nuclear nucle, nuclear nuclear powered banana straightener and uh basically the idea is you have this chamber down here the reformation chamber uh, it's like a flexible tube because it's flexible enough that you slide the banana into it any banana you want to straighten shoop, you slide it in there uh, it's like a metal tube made of like different little sections and then you slide it in there you attach the hoses on either end And then there are all these little mechanical arms, a system, a series of uh, gears and levers and stuff, which are hooked up to these gears over here, which are hooked up to this turbine. And this is a steam turbine, which is powered by steam coming out of this um Nu the, this nuclear reactor, these fuel rods are extremely hot because the uranium is decaying, which is a very hot reaction. So it heats up the, the fuel rods heat up the, the water that they're in, which turns, which creates a lot of steam here in the top of this chamber. The steam goes in here. And it's already pretty pressurized, but it's mostly just extremely hot. Uh, it's pressurized and the pressurizer comes down here. Incredible amount of pressure hot air goes around here turns the turbine and uh turns these gears and they their natural state uh they eventually all turn to a spot where the the tube is straight but 
You can't just do that. That will break the banana, okay? It'll be ripped, broken. It's not satisfying. It's not what we're going for. What we want takes another part of the equation, which is out here on the other side of the turbine, some excess steam can go here. There's a T-junction. Some of the excess steam comes in here to this hose we clamped on at the beginning and helps to soften the banana, kind of like... Um, have you ever heard of those people that bend wood and do crazy stuff by wood? They steam the wood first. It's kind of like that, but it's a lot more pressure, heat, uh, and it's a lot quicker. This only takes about um, 30 or 45 seconds per banana. And then once it's done, uh, this little valve here, it's shown in the open position. It goes poof, poof. There's a big blow off of excess pressure. Um, it automatically happens so that it doesn't all blow up in your face, you know, when you try to open it. Um, but also excess steam, um, along with excess steam from the turbine, also goes back up here into a pump, goes into a, a reliquifier, and then once again pumped back into the reactor core here. And also you can get extra water to um, refill the whole system if you need to from the outside. So there you go. Any questions? And usually, of course, this is all encased in a like reinforced concrete uh, barriers and shield. All right, and finally, we have the atomic reverse death ray. Makes people feel better than before, or it said, Breaks people feel better than before they did when shot with its laser. Oh, oh the, the nuclear-powered banana straightener was sent in by Tactical Grace. All right, so basically, a normal death ray blasts you and takes away a bunch of your life and just leaves you with a bunch of death, right? So, and usually you would be over here at the end, at the, the bad end of the death ray. It's not as much a reverse death ray, really, as you're in uh, a different part of the death ray process. So you, if you want to partake in this, would stand here near the beginning of the death ray. And basically what it does, it once it fires, it goes through and it, it removes a bunch of death from you and leaves you with just a bunch of life instead of removing life from you and leaving you only with death. Uh, and, and really this, um, you might notice, is really just a, the, the scientific way of creating a horcrux. You might have heard of horcruxes in um, silly fictional um, tales like Harry Potter. That's just all magic mumbo jumbo. This is actually a way where you can take some of your death uh, and put it into what here, which is labeled the receptacle object. Be aware, just like those fictional horcruxes, if this object is destroyed, then your death will also die. And so that part of you will die. Okay? So protect these things. Most people just keep them in a safety deposit box. It's pretty straightforward. So yeah, primary ignition laser goes through the focusing array, the calibration ligature. Basically, this part kind of scans the target slash victim, make sure everything is appropriate, going well. There's the stairs you walk up to stand there. It just takes a second. You can just walk up, they fire it, you walk back down, feeling more alive. And I know you don't really know what I mean by that, but trust me, once you've had it done to you, that's really the only way to describe it is more alive. I guess it's really, it's, it's weird to say less dead because most of us, you don't think you're a little bit dead, but trust me, you are. Uh, intake manifold, there's a heat sink because it obviously does generate a lot of hink and heat. And you'll notice that a lot of these pieces aren't actually connected except by these sink cables, which just do, these are fiber optic and they keep everything uh, linked up. I mean, I think they're fiber optic. They're actually bending kind of sharply at some points to be fiber optic. I'm not sure I have to double check on that. Uh, but it works fine. Here's a photon compressor, which is one of the main technologies that goes through the power crystals, the reticulation cask, the barrel, the nozzle. And with, once they actually fire it, the scientist won't actually be, this is just the scientist 
placing or, you know, yeah, placing the, the receptacle object there. And then these movable steps slide away. So there you go. Thanks for uh, all the ideas, everyone. There were a lot more ideas in that tweet. These are just a few that I felt like drawing today. It's a good time. These are cool, cool inks, cool pen. Fun time. Good lines, good vibes. I don't know what else to say, but thanks for watching. Love y'all. Bye.